Hey, what is up, everyone? Welcome back to another session of uh, Live Try Hack Me Hacking. Tyler Ramsby here on the Hack Smarter Twitch channel. If you're watching this live, welcome. If you're watching this after the fact on YouTube, welcome. Either way, it is good to have you here. I am starting early tonight and uh, almost an hour early. I plan on doing the same like length of time. I'll be going till midnight. So I'm just gonna hack a little bit longer today and we'll see what we can get knocked out. We're gonna begin with the breaching AD room on Try Hack Me, which is where I left things off on Sunday evening. And my hope is we'll finish that. And Try Hack Me just released another free network called Enumerating Active Directory. So if we can finish the breaching AD room, we will jump into the Enumerating Active Directory room. So let me share my screen. And let me get Twitch pulled up so I can monitor the chat. And as always, you can also join me on Discord. Um, if you post a comment, if you're not already in the Discord on Twitch, I can share the link. I am streaming live in Twitch as well. So if you jump in Discord, or not Twitch, I'm getting myself confused. I'm looking over my other screen. If you do jump on in Discord, it's a voice channel. So you're welcome to ask questions if you'd like. Um, otherwise, either way, you can just hang out and hopefully we can learn together. And what I try to make uh, plain at the beginning of every one of my streams, I do not claim to be an expert or anything near an expert. So I am doing this to learn. Hopefully you're here to learn as well. And if you're further along this path than I am, please, if I do anything that's silly, that doesn't make any sense, or maybe there's a more efficient way to do something, please call me out. I want to learn right alongside of you. Nate said, look at that hoodie. Yeah, dude. I know you said it's like hot outside. It is 62 degrees here in my little basement office. So it's always hoodie weather, even when it's like 100 degrees out with 90% humidity. It's beautiful, beautiful down here. So got my hoodie on. I already got connected to the VPN, but I do want to let you guys know if you were following along before, I noticed for me, I had to re-download the configuration file for the network because once the network reboots, I guess, I don't know if this is true for everyone, but for me, I had to go re-download the configuration file. I already added the um, domain controller into my DNS settings on my VM. So just know if you're following along, you may have to, number one, re-download your configuration file, and number two, re-add the domain controller to your DNS and your network manager settings on Kali Linux, and then you should be good to go. But let's go ahead and get Active Directory pulled up. I'll pull it over to this screen. And let's just go from where we left off. And I'm just trying to remember where we're at. So we got our authentication relay set up. Oh, that's right. So we grabbed that hash for that service account. Let's go ahead and look at that stuff. Because we got lucky. We got that hash right before um, I stopped streaming. Okay, what do we all have here? We have some creds.txt. I think those are the people using default creds. Yep, they're using the default change me one, two, three. We have that service file copy, which I believe are the creds. Yep, we had that hash right there. So if you remember, we had this hash and we cracked it with hashcat and we got this F password one exclamation mark. And then I believe we also pivoted. No, we didn't pivot. We, we um, set up a rogue LDAP server with responder, if I remember right. And then we made a connection, a test connection with a printer. So it would send us the hash. Now it's all coming back to me from Sunday. So let's dive back into it. We already did that, and this is where we left off on Sunday. So let's start where we left off. Microsoft Deployment Toolkit. All right, and I'm just gonna read through this. I'm trying to zoom in for you. Um, I read this in its entirety uh, for me because I notice when I don't stream live, I have a tendency to skim these things, and then I get to uh, something down here and I get stuck or it breaks because I didn't read it in its entirety. So I read it for me but I also read it out loud for you. I think it it's important when you do try hack me rooms that have, are more walkthrough based, it's important to really slow down, read, think through the details. That's one of the best ways that you can learn. So Microsoft Deployment Toolkit. Large organizations need tools to deploy and manage the infrastructure of the estate. This is actually a lot of what I do in my day job. Um, yeah, so this will be interesting. In massive organizations, you can't have your IT personnel using DVDs or flash drives. Instead, you use floppy disks, right? Running around installing software on every single machine. Or as Nate knows, what our school called these was 
memory sticks or something. I don't remember what they called it when we got in trouble. Uh, luckily, Microsoft already provides the tools required to manage the estate. However, we can exploit misconfigurations in the tools to also breach AD. Let's do it. Microsoft Deployment Toolkit, SCCM is what I use like every single day in my job. It's now called MECM Microsoft. I don't know what it stands for, but it's no longer SCCM is MECM technically to be correct. Microsoft Deployment Toolkit is a Microsoft service that assists with automating the deployment of the Microsoft OS. Large organizations use services such as MDT. Actually, I'm getting myself distracted. I do want to show you guys one thing real quick. If you're interested in learning Active Directory, John Hammond is doing a series to set up your own lab. And I uh, did that earlier. I have my own domain controller set up. I have a couple of workstations I joined. So if you are new to Active Directory, one of the best ways to learn it is hands-on. So I do a lot of it in my job, my day job right now, but I also want it in my own home lab. So um, look up John Hammond, look up his Active Directory series. If you do have questions about that, shoot me a message. I'd be happy to help you because there's some gotchas as you're setting it up. So if you do get stuck and you want to set up your own AD lab, uh, I'd be happy to, to help you out with that. All right, usually... MDT is integrated with Microsoft System Center Configuration Manager, and it's called MEC now. Um, i trying to remember what that stands for. Yeah, now it's Microsoft Endpoint Configuration Manager. Same exact thing, it's just they changed the name, and it's all a lot of it's moving into now, which is kind of the cloud-based type stuff for Azure, and it also can, you can deploy on-prem AD. All right, which manages all updates for all Microsoft applications, services, and operating systems. Speaking of that, today is Patch Tuesday, and uh, Microsoft finally released a patch to address the zero day with uh, MSDT type stuff. So if you are a system admin or you manage patches, make sure you get that patch pushed out to your environment. There's my free cybersecurity advice for you. MDT is used for new deployments. Essentially, it allows the IT team to pre-configure and manage boot images. Hence, if they need to configure a new machine, they just need to plug in a network cable. Did that in my last job all the time, imaging computers, and everything happens automatically, as long as the script is configured properly. Uh, they can make various changes to the boot image, such as already installing default software like Office 365 and the organization's antivirus of choice. It can also ensure that the new build is updated the first time the installation runs. SCCM can be seen as almost an expansion and the big brother to MDT. What happens to the software after, all, after it is installed? Well, SC, SCCM does this type of patch management. It allows the IT team to review available updates to all software installed across the estate. That is one of my big jobs actually right now. The team can also test these patches in a sandbox environment to ensure they are stable before essentially deploying them to all domain joint machines. Good practice, especially with Windows. It makes the life of the IT team significantly easier. However, anything that provides central management of infrastructure such as MDT or SCCM can also be targeted by attackers in an attempt to take over large portions of critical functions in the estate. And truly, if you have access to SCCM, um, you nearly have keys to the kingdom. You can set really cool stuff. You can run scripts. You can do configuration baselines, which actually go out and um, checks if a computer has a certain setting. And if it doesn't, it will remediate that and apply it. I use SCCM to remediate unquoted service paths and over 5,000 endpoints through a configuration baseline, just some very basic PowerShell scripting. So it's powerful stuff for good, uh, but it can also be powerful for evil. Although MDT can be configured in various ways, for this task we will focus exclusively on a configuration called Preboot Execution Environment or Pixie Boot. At least that's how I've learned to say it. Large organizations use Pixie Boot to allow new devices that are connected to the network to load and install the OS directly over a network connection. MDD can be used to create, manage, and host Pixie Boot images. Pixie Boot is usually integrated with DHCP, which means that if DHCP assigns an IP lease, the host is allowed to request the Pixie Boot image and start the network OS installation process. I wonder if we're gonna like corrupt a Pixie Boot image and use that to attack the domain. That would be cool. The communication flow is shown in the diagram below. Number one, here's us, the user. User sends DHCP discover, which means it requests an IP address and Pixie server. The DHCP server sends DHCP offer, which is an IP and Pixie server info. The user sends a DHCP request, accepts the IP. The server says, sweet, here's my acknowledgement. 
Um, the client performs boot service discover. And here is our MDT server for that boot image. The server acknowledges and sends Pixie boot information. The client, the user requests Pixie boot via TFTP and then they deliver the Pixie boot. Once the process is performed, the client will use TFTP connection to download the Pixie boot image. We can exploit the Pixie boot image for do two different purposes. Very cool. Inject a privilege escalation vector, such as a local admin account to gain administrative access to the OS once the Pixie boot has been completed. Perform password scraping attacks to recover AD creds used during the install. And one practice that a lot of companies use, even though it's bad practice, is they have a local admin account um, with a password there. And that's often how they run all that script. And in many times, if you get your hands on the script, that admin password is hard coded into that script as well. And so if you can get that local admin account, you can use that for privilege escalation. In this task, we will focus on the latter. So a password scraping attack, cool. We will attempt to recover the deployment service accounts associated with the MDT service during installation for this password scraping attack. Furthermore, there's also the possibility of retrieving other AD accounts used for the unattended installation of applications and services. Pixie boot image retrieval. Since DHCP is a bit finicky, we will bypass the initial steps of this attack. We will skip the part where we attempt to request an IP and the Pixie boot pre-configured details from DHCP. We will perform the rest of the attack from this step in the process manually. The first piece of information regarding the Pixie boot pre-configure you would have received via DHCP is the IP of the MDT server. In our case, you can recover that information from the TriHackMe network diagram. There it is right there. Oh no, MDT is right there. 10.200.4.202. Okay, keep that IP in mind. Hopefully you guys got it memorized. I don't. Um, blah, blah, blah. In our case, you can cover it. The second piece of information you would have received was the names of the BCD files. These files store the information relevant to Pixie Boots for the different types of architecture. To receive this information, you'll need to connect to this web fight. Let's go and just check this out. My Google Chrome's been bugging out on my Kali Linux machine, so we'll see what happens. Okay. Am I supposed to be able to open these? I'd assume I am. All right, let's not get ahead of ourselves. These files store blah blah, it lists various BCD files, which it did. Usually you would use TFTP to request each of these BCD files and enumerate the configuration for all of them. However, in the interest of time, we will focus on the BCD file of the X64 architecture. Copy and store the full name of this file. For the rest of this exercise, we will be using the this name placeholder since the files and their names are regenerated by mdt every day each time you see this placeholder remember to place it with your specific bcd file name okay with this initial information now recovered from, from dhcp wink wink we can enumerate and retrieve the pixie boot image we will be using our ssh connection on thm jump one for the next couple of steps so please authenticate to the ssh session using the following do i need to download this oh we're gonna do it in just a second okay cool so let's go ahead and ssh in very strong password password one at sign Okay, we're on the jump box, sweet. To ensure that all users of the network can use SSH, start by creating a folder with your username and copying the PowerPixie repo into this folder. Okay. Did they just mean my try hack me username? I think so. And where were they creating that at? Did it matter? In documents, okay, sounds good. 
So are there other people's f files in here? No. Should be anything in there. Okay, cool, cool. Let me, I'm gonna just go like this. So I have to keep minimizing. Um, where's my machine? Oh, it's full screen. I need to make it not full screen. Okay, let's try that again now. Let's give Kali Linux like most of the room. And I'm just gonna adjust my text a little bit. I try to make it big so you guys can see it, but we'll make it just a little bit smaller there. Hopefully you can still see the text. If that's too small, let me know and I can adjust it. All right, the communication, let's back up. No, nope, we already looked at that. Okay, so we're gonna copy, well, okay, that would be good if I could type that right. So there's the power pixie. I see, so we're gonna, oh, we're gonna copy the whole folder, I got it. So if we copy that power pixie, we're gonna put it in, RC users, THM, documents, Tenna Bray. Okay. There it is. Cool. The first step we need, did I miss anything? No. The first step we need to perform is using TFTP and downloading our BCD file to read the configuration of the MDT server. TFTP is a bit trickier than FTP since we can't list files. Instead, we send a file request and the server will connect back to us via UDP, untrusted, right? I, I don't remember what video I was watching, but UDP is like a bad friend. Um, it's actually not a bad friend, but uh, UDP to transfer the file. Hence, we need to be accurate when specifying files and file paths. The BCD files are always located in the temp directory on the MDT server. We can initiate the TFTP transfer using the following command in our SSH session. Let's give it a shot. Don't remember the IP. Oh my goodness. Dot four dot two oh two. All right, you guys remember that? Oh, I already forgot it. Ten dot two hundred. <laughs> Ten dot two hundred dot four dot two or something. Dot four dot two oh two. How bad I am with numbers, my goodness. Oh, whoops, come on. Oh, went too far. Okay, so TFT-I, which I assume is a switch that means IP, we're gonna get, so we're sending a get request, TMP, and now we need that X64 file. I think it's this one right here, isn't it? So if we go like that, conf.bcd, try that. So far, so good. You have to look up THMD IP with blah, 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 blah. With the BCD file now recovered, we will be using PowerPixie to read its contents. PowerPixie is a PowerShell script that automatically performs this type of attack, but usually with varying results. 
So it is better to perform a manual approach. We will use the get WIM file function of PowerPixie to recover the locations of the Pixie boot images from the BCD file. Sweet. So let's do PowerShell EP bypass. Get our PowerShell open. Then we can use ls, which is an alias for git dash child item. I think that like the native PowerShell command is git dash child item, but ls works as well. Okay. So we need to import a module. Okay, cool. And we're setting a variable. So we're calling our BCD file equals conf.bcd. We'll store that in a variable. And now git whim file dash BCD file. And there's our variable name. I don't know why I keep making it all caps. I don't think it really matters though. Okay. Identify WIM file. And so it gave us a location here. Boot x64 images. There's WIM and the boot x64 images light touch. WIM files. Hybrid said, these are all Linux commands. Nope, we're actually in PowerShell right now. I know it's a little bit confusing. Um, we are we are on our Linux machine, but we connected to a Windows machine via SSH, and now we're in PowerShell. So some of these like uh, verb, noun, git, wim file, import, module, we're actually working in, in PowerShell right now within Windows. No, totally fine. It's uh, no question's a bad question hybrid. Thanks for joining us. And hopefully I try to do my best to explain everything. You might feel a little bit in over your head, but I know we do have some plans to doing more introductory videos, but I would encourage you if, uh, to check out tryhackme.com and they have some really good rooms to get you introduced to Linux and some offensive security type stuff, but feel free to join me tonight, hang on for the ride and I'll do my best to explain what's going on and feel free to ask questions when things don't make sense. All right, WIM files are bootable images on the Windows imaging format. Now that we have the location of the Pixie boot image, we can again use TFTP to download this image. Sweet. TFTP-I. Uh, I have to know the stupid IP again. Do you guys remember what it was? Let's see if I can remember it. 10 dot 202 all right. Ten dot two hundred. I think I got it, guys. I'm doing good tonight. That's what I'm talking about. It's the hoodie that I have on. Um, Hybrid said, "Thank you for doing this. I am in over my head, but I like to watch, getting exposed to things I don't understand. I'm in school for cyber, going for my associates by year. Sweet man, or man or lady. I guess I shouldn't assume your gender, but it, it's it really is good to have you. And just know that we stream." Uh, literally seven nights a week, either me or my friend Nate, and we are on usually around this time. And so truly, it's good to have you. It's Wilson from the Works Wonder Discord. Keep the salt work. You're a great teacher. Thank you, Wilson. Appreciate it, man. I do. I'm pretty sure I do know your gender. So I can call you man. So thank you for the kind words. And um, yeah, and like I, like I said, I'm I'm learning this right alongside of you guys. So a lot of these things I've never done before. And that's why I'm doing these rooms. So you get to watch me learn, watch me make mistakes, watch me troubleshoot, and hopefully you find it beneficial or maybe humorous at some point in time as well. All right, go back to where we were at. Okay, so we're gonna do another get request. We have our IP there, we're gonna get, and then we're gonna get from that, um, that right there. So let's just copy it so I don't screw it up. Always a, always a good practice. Okay, we got that. And we'll call it pixieboot.wim. Shoot. The name FTFP. Okay, well, if I learn how to spell, that'd be a good starting point. I really messed that up. I screw something else up, it's taking a while. 
Oh, this download will take a while. I should probably read that. This download will take a while since you are downloading a fully bootable and configured Windows image. Maybe stretch your legs and grab a glass of water while you wait. You know what I think that means, everyone? I think it means it is time for a break. Let's take a five minute break, stand up, walk around, hang out. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go upstairs, fill up my water, and I'll be back. So be back in about five minutes.
Hey, hey, welcome back to the stream. Hey, before we dive back into the hacking, I do want to share with you guys, for those of you who are unaware, when you are watching that loading screen, I'm trying to pull up Twitch, sorry, it's hard for me to keep all these screens organized. For those of you watching that loading screen, you may be wondering to yourself, what is that um, work smarter thing that was being shared? And I wanna share with you a Discord that we started a while back. I'm just gonna pull it over to my other screen to kind of show you guys what's so cool about this Discord. You'll see me on it. Let me go ahead and share my screen. There we go. So here's the Discord for Work Smarter. That's where our name Hack Smarter comes from. Uh, the really cool thing about this Discord, one is it's a super active community. So this started actually with me and Nate, who's the other streamer. We began meeting. Hey, Wilson's waving on it. That's awesome. <laughs> we. <laughs> That's great, dude. Uh, we began meeting uh, October of 20. 21 i think just me and nate to hold one another accountable as we're studying and that that grew and eventually it has become this discord with i don't know i think we're at over 150 people on here i think what sets our discord apart from others is we meet every monday night at 7 30 p.m central time to share our goals to hold one another accountable uh last monday we gave away a voucher for the security plus certification thanks to the generosity of one of our members the week i think it was the week before that we gave away a one-year subscription to try hack me thanks to the generosity of our different admins and moderators who all pitched some money together to be able to do that so but if you're interested in learning uh cybersecurity it just growing in your career come join us on discord it looks like nate posted the link in the chat so if you're not on here come join us we would love to have you be part of our community all right now that my commercial brick is over it finished downloading, took almost exactly five minutes. It finished just a little bit ago. So there we have the pixieboot.wim image. Hopefully you stretched your legs and grabbed a glass of water. Recovering creds from a pixie boot image. Now that we have recovered the pixie boot image, we can ex exfiltrate stored credentials. And that's what I was telling you about. It should be noted that there are various attacks that we could stage. We could inject a local admin user. So we have admin access as soon as the image boots. We could install the image to have a domain join machine. If you're interested in learning more about these attacks, you can read this article. Let's see if there's anything interesting in here. Taking over Windows workstations thanks to LDAPs and Pixie. I'm not going to read through this whole thing, but... Um... I'm going to check this out maybe offline. I don't want to bore you guys with the wall of text. But this does look like a pretty interesting article. Because I've used these things like in practice and I always thought that they could be exploited. But of course, I don't feel like going to prison. So I've never exploited them in a production environment and never, <laughs> I never plan on it. Uh, this exercise will focus on a simple attack of just attempting to exfiltrate creds. Again, we will use Power Pixie to recover the credentials. But you could also do this step manually by extracting the image and looking for the bootstrap.ini file where these types of credentials are often stored. To use PowerPixie to recover the credentials in the bootstrap file, run the following command. Let's do it. Git dash find credentials wim file pixieboot.wim. Open pixieboot.wim. Operation running. What's gonna happen? The zeros are going fast. Hopefully we get some credentials. We did, user domain, ZA, user ID, S, V, C, M, D, T, and user password, Pixie Boot Secure One. We are real hackers, ladies and gentlemen. All right. As you can see, Power Pixie was able to recover the AD creds. We now have another set of AD creds that we can use. And let's go ahead and just steal those AD creds for our notes. Take a screenshot. And I'll show you guys what my notes look like. I use OneNote. There's probably much better note taking applications, but OneNote is what I use. You can see I have notes for almost every stage of the hacking process I put together by attending various classes, by um, going through Pass and Try Hack Me. But let's go to Breaching AD. Let's just throw those in there so we have it recorded. 
Okay, what Microsoft tool is used to create and host Pixie boot images and organizations? It says just the MDT stuff. Yeah, hi so hybrid, my best advice for you while you're learning is take a bunch of notes one it will be helpful when you get into it maybe you're already in it i don't know if you are or not but documentation is huge and it's something people suck at to be honest so get in the process of taking notes and i'll give you kind of a quick rundown of my notes so if i open up active directory right here um i have kind of an overview here i have different poisoning i have hashcat um and i I've just jotted these things down. So if I'm going through a machine, I can follow, look at my sweet writing skills. I can follow my steps, step by step. Here's one I use a lot for privilege escalation when I get it on a Linux server. Some of these I wrote myself, some I copy and pasted, but um, take lots of notes as you're learning stuff. Therefore, you don't have to repeat all your work when you're doing stuff. You'll see it, I got stuff. I have most of the OWASP, OWASP top 10 um, how to exploit them, how to defend against them, step-by-step -step attacks, all that stuff. So yeah, notes are important. Okay. Is it Microsoft Deployment Toolkit? Is that the answer you're looking for? I'm just gonna make this big so I can see how long it is. Oh yeah, that's probably what it is. Perfect. And hey, Hybrid, if you want, if you join our Discord, my name on Discord is just Tyler Ramsby. Uh, shoot me a message and anyone can do this. If you shoot me a message, I will share with you my notes free of charge. You can have all of my notes that I've taken and you can benefit from the work that I put in and the notes can become yours. Make them your own, edit them, add to them. They can be your notes. So shoot me a message and I'd be happy to share my notes with you. What network protocol is used for recovery of files from the MDT servers? That's TFTP. And what is the username associated with the account that was stored in the Pixie boot image? That was that service account, service MDT. What is the password associated with that? Pixie boot secure. Well, you should make sure to clean up your user directory that you created at the start of the task. If you try, you will notice that you can access denied error. Don't worry, a script will help with the cleanup process, but remember when you are doing assessments to always perform cleanup. We're almost done with breaching AD, my friends. Let's go ahead and... I keep trying to set up a shared folder between my Windows machine and my Kali machine, and for some reason it doesn't want to work. So let's go ahead and just grab these configuration files real quick. If Try Hack Me wants to cooperate. Actually, it's not really Try Hack Me. For some reason, Chrome and Kali has just been buggy lately. I don't know what it is. I haven't uninstalled and reinstalled Chrome. Here we go. Let's grab those McAfee site lists. Well, that sounds fun, doesn't it? Let's go ahead and grab those and let's rename this shell. Move that McAfee site list to home, Cali, try hack me, breaching AD. Unzip it. And, oh, so we have a password decryptor. Is that all that was in there? No. Oh, it's a folder. Just look at it real quick before I even look at the task. No, let's, let's open up a subble. Password decryption tool for the McAfee site list at XML file. Thanks, Jerome Nokin at gmail.com. Example usage is some references here. We use the Python script. Looks like little hash, encrypted password, and decrypt the password, my strong password. Okay, cool. Let's do it in practice.
The last enumeration avenue we will explore in this network is configuration files. Let me go ahead and close this out. Suppose you were lucky enough to cause a breach that gave you access to a host on the organization's network. Now, you only do a breach if you have permission, right? Don't go test this out on your company's Active Directory network. I cannot be held liable for your stupid decisions. In that case, configuration files are an excellent avenue to explore in an attempt to recover AD creds. Depending on the host that was breached, ear itches. Come on, ear, stop itching. We're streaming. Depending on the host that was breached, various configuration files may be a value for enumeration. Web application config files, service config files, registry key essentially deployed applications. Several enumeration scripts, such as seatbelt, we use that in throwback, or I should say I attempted to use that in throwback, can be used to automate this process. Configuration file credentials. However, we will focus on recovering creds from a centrally deployed application in this task. Usually these applications need a method to authenticate to the domain during both the installation and execution phases. <laughs> Barf on throwback. Um, if you want to watch frustration, join Nate tomorrow night as he continues to work through throwback. I didn't finish watching your stream. Did you finish throwback yet, Nate? Or are you still working? Are you still torturing yourself and working through it? Wait for you to answer. An, an example of such still on it. Okay, so if you want to watch Nate torture himself, come back tomorrow. Or not tomorrow evening. I think I am the one on... Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, come back on Friday, begin your Friday, begin your weekend watching Nate torture himself with a throwback network. It's always a good time. Um, usually these applications need a method to authenticate to the domain during both the installation and execution phases. An example of such as typo of such an application is McAfee enterprise endpoint security. If you've ever looked at the history of the McAfee dude, the dude was insane. Which organizations can use as the endpoint detection and response tool for security. McAfee embeds the credentials used during installation to connect back to the orchestrator in a file called ma.db for database. This database file can be retrieved and read with local access to the host to recover the associated AD service account. We will be using the SSH access on THM jump one again for the exercise, which is right here. Let's go ahead and rename this though, just to keep it straight. All right, here's our shell. Here's our Windows machine. The mod DB file is stored in a fixed location. Okay. Ma.db. There it is. We can use SCP to copy the Ma.db to our attack box. Um, that syntax that they're using there looks weird to me. But maybe not. Oh, I think it's just because it's so small. So SCP is a way you copy files uh, through SSH. So if you have an SSH connection to a machine, then an easy way to transfer files from the victim machine to your attack machine is SCP. I always forget the syntax, so Google's your friend when it comes to syntax. Thanks for the, giving it to us here. So we're going to do SCP. And it looks like we're doing our name because remember we SSH into this machine as THM. So that's just the username that we're SSH into. And then the IP or host name, which is going to be THM jump one dot ZA dot try hack me dot com. And then the file path. Don't know if we need this full file path when we're already in um, the folder with it, but I guess we'll do it until I spell it wrong, like that. And it's just mod.db, right? Yeah. And then we'll save it to our current location on our attack machine. I don't remember the password. <laughs> Is it password? 
oh one or something silly like that let's see if we can find it real quick password one at sign I broke it. See, I, let me look at this SCP. I don't, that syntax didn't look right to me. So we want to get it on our attack machine, right? Oh, it should be run from Callie's Bash. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Nate. I mean, you could do it from Windows, right? But it would be a, a way different syntax. Well, not way different, but it'd be a different syntax. That's what was throwing me off. So yeah, you run it. You can run it this way, but you're doing it from your attack machine. Yeah, just reorganize the file says, Okay, I knew I wasn't missing. I mean, I knew I was missing, but I knew it looked different. Because now it's going to ask for the password. I was wondering why it was asking me for the password and I was logged into the machine. Password one at sign. LS. There it is. We got Ma database. Perfect. To read the database file, we will use a tool called SQLite Browser. Don't let them tell you it's pronounced SQL. It's definitely SQL. SQLite Browser. We can open the database using the following command. Is that built into Linux or into Kali? It is. Here we go. What up, Spin Tech? WTF? I'm not sure what you're responding to, but <laughs> if I said something that's confusing, feel free to call me out on it. How dare you? SQL isn't okay. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna end this argument once and for all. The reason it's pronounced SQL and not SQL is the original language was actually spelled out as SQL. It was spelled out like that. Uh, I think I may have spelled it wrong there. Some people are for SQL, some are for SQL, and still others make their own enunciations. A standard says that SQL is the appropriate way of speaking SQL. Wrong. And I'll tell you why. Okay, after moving to the San Jose Research Laboratory in 1973, they began working on a sequel to Square. The name SQL, that was the name of the programming language, was later changed to SQL, dropping the vowels, because SQL was a trademark of blah, blah, blah. So the language was called SQL. It's not SQL. <laughs> Nate says, he even know this is a debate. Yeah, it's a big debate. And what I've noticed is like, programmers call it sql and for some reason people who work in linux call it sql so one day i like i read through this wikipedia article to try to figure it out and from my perspective if the original name of the programming language was called sql and it was only changed to stop it from conflicting with this trademark then the proper name way to pronounce it is still sql if it's an acronym what does it stand for Structured query, well, yeah, okay. It is technically an acronym, but it's pronounced SQL. We'll have to agree to disagree. <laughs> but it is it is a debate. But for our intended purposes, because I'm the, I'm the one with the microphone, I'm calling it SQL. You have to unsubscribe from Twitch if you even subscribed. I don't even know how that works. Digging yourself further here. I am kind of digging myself further. You're right. Let's just dump back into the box. You guys are distracting me with your silly debates. Okay. I'm just going to pretend like that didn't happen. Using SQLite, SQL, like, what sounds better? SQLite or SQLite? Using SQLite. SQLite, however you want to say it, using SQLite browser, we will select the browse data option and focus on the agent repositories table. Okay. Using our SQ, SQLite browser, 
we're here. We are particularly interested in the second entry focused on the domain. Uh, is that name? How do I read this stuff? Oh, hold up. Am I looking? Oh, brow oh browse data. Is that what I need to go to? I broke it. I don't know what I'm doing. I can execute X SQL. How do I get back to where I was at? Oh, it's right here. Duh. I just have it pulled further over here. It throws me off when my screen's small here. Okay, we're particularly interested in the second entry focused on the domain. open all these up whoops let's do it's all in here agent repositories is what I think we're supposed to be at okay in the second agent repositories yep we're pretty interested in the second entry focused on the domain auth user and auth password field entries domain auth user auth password entries um, however, the auth password field is encrypted. How do we open it? I'm right clicking. Do I browse data on it? Okay, let's just keep reading. Maybe it'll tell me. Luckily, McAfee encrypts this field with a known key. Good job. Good job, McAfee. Good job. Therefore, we will use the following old Python 2 script to decrypt the password. The script is provided as a downloadable task file, blah, blah. The tool we will use here is quite old. It uses Python version 2 and relies on an old crypto library. If you cannot get the script to work on your own VM, please make use of the attack box. I'm not going to make use of the attack box. We're going we're gonna to make it work. Unzip by providing the script with our base64 encoded and encrypted password. The script will provide the decrypted password. How the heck do I get the password, yo? What am I missing? Auth password. Auth password text. Nope. Here we go. I think I got it. So if we do like browse table, here we go. That's what I'm looking for. So you do Python two. Oh, we need to go into the folder first. What's the syntax? Oh, it's not gonna work. It's just base 64 encoded, right? Shoot. I don't want to open the attack box. Maybe we'll have to. Port it over to Python 3. I'm not going to waste my time doing that. <sighs> Why won't it? What's it do? 
So it imports this library. That's that's the library having issues with, I think. Here's the X. So we have the key here. Can we just manually do this? How do I add like the XOR key? Shoot. What else does a script do? Join some key, enumerate. Oh, we have a. I got gotcha. Maybe someone's already ported over to Python 3. So I was already doing this hex there. Okay. I really don't feel like doing an attack box. Whatever. I guess I'll do attack box. I don't think it disconnects my other machine. And we'll have to give attack box a second to load. So for those of you new to try hack me, uh, attack box is like a built in, it's not necessarily Kali, but it's similar to a Kali machine. You can run it from your browser. The reason I don't like to use it is, in my opinion, it's buggy and it doesn't teach you good troubleshooting because they set everything up for you. So I prefer to use my own VM because I can customize the environment. I'm just surprised there's not just something online. Um, let's just look for this. Or someone hasn't, you know, ported it over to Python 3 to make it work. Uh, so, Spintech, if you look for it on here, uh, let me just share this link in the chat. This seems to be the exact script. Oh, there's a PowerShell script that does it? Retrieves the plain text passwords. Oh, it just retrieves the plain text password. Well, encoded password. Oh yeah, okay. What? Attack machine's almost there. Oh, 
All these links are dead. Yeah. Question is, what did I do with the hash? <laughs> Um, did I forget to save it? I apparently forgot to save the hash. Let me just grab that real quick. So don't forget it this time. All right, we got attack box open. Where was this saved on attack box? Just see if we can locate it real quick. Um, Here we go. Why can't I, why can't, oh that's right, you have to do this stupid way to pay stuff, right? It's kind of coming back to me now. Is that copied now? Decrypt a password. My strong password. We got it. Okay. Let's grab. So it's my strong password exclamation mark. Let's close this now. Well, let me make sure I get that recorded. And now let's go ahead and close this out. Watch them ask for me to use it again in a second. Okay, we now once again have a set of AD creds that we can use for further enumeration. This is just one example of recovering credentials from configuration files. If you're ever able to gain a foothold on a host, make sure to follow a detailed and refined methodology to ensure that you recover all loot from the host, including credentials and other sensitive information that can be stored in configuration files. What type of files often contain stored credentials on hosts? Configuration files? Okay. What is the name of McAfee database? Ma.db. What table in this database stores the credentials of the orchestrator? I don't remember what it's called. Agent repositories, is that what it's looking for? What is the username of the AD account associated with the McAfee service? Duh, I might have to look on my machine again. McAfee HTTP. EP oh, service AV right there. What is the password of the AD account associated with it? My strong password one. Conclusion. A significant amount of attack of Evan News avenues can be followed to breach AD. 
We covered some of those commonly seen being used during a red team exercise in this network. Due to the sheer size, let me just pause here. One confusion is red team versus pen tester. Um, and you may hear these two different terms thrown around. A red team is usually employed by the organization themselves. Like if you're a red team member, you're an employee of the organization. And red teams seek to emulate APTs or advanced persistent threats more accurately. And APT, the correct answer of what an APT is, it's usually like a nation state actor or another uh, malicious attacker with a lot of resources who can remain on the network, remain undetected. And so if you work on a red team, you are to simulate that APT environment so that you can continually keep the blue team on their toes to provide good defense. A pen tester, on the other hand, is more of a cybersecurity consultant or offensive security consultant where a company hires you as essentially a contractor, you have to work for another company, but you're hired as a contractor to do a penetration test to get some of that low hanging fruit. Um, but also just to look at what are some misconfigurations of the environment. Often you receive the source code, you receive all the internal network diagrams, just so you can really dig into their environment. And it comes up with a pen test report. So when you see those two different terms are similar, but slightly different. Uh, we covered some of those commonly seen being used during a red team exercise in this network. Due to the sheer size of the attack surface, new avenues to recover that first set of AD creds are constantly being discovered. Building a proper enumeration methodology, aka notes, and continuously updating it will be required to find that initial pair of creds. Mitigations. In terms of mitigations, there are some steps that organizations can take. User awareness and training, this is huge. The weakest link in the cybersecurity chain is almost always users. Training users and making them aware that they should be careful about disclosing sensitive information such as creds and not trust suspicious emails reduces this attack surface. Two, limit the exposure of AD services and applications online. Not all applications must be accessible from the internet, especially those that support NTLM and LDAP authentication. Instead, these applications should be placed in an intranet that can be accessed through a VPN. The VPN can then support multi-factor authentication for added security. If your company does not have you receive text messages when you log into stuff, you're asking to be hacked. Enforce network access control. Network access control can prevent attackers from connecting rogue devices on the network. However, it will require a quite a bit of effort since legitimate devices will have to be allow listed that's gotten a lot easier with some of the the newer access point technology that we have enforce smb signing by enforcing smb signing smb relay tax are not possible and follow the principle of least privileges in most cases an attacker will be able to recover a set of ad creds by following the principle of least privilege especially for credentials used for services the risk associated with these creds being compromised can be significantly reduced. The principle of least privilege says this, you should only have the amount of authority and access you absolutely need to perform your job functions. HR should not be able to access IT and IT should not be able to access sensitive HR information, right? The principle of least privilege is you only have the access and the knowledge absolutely needed to perform your job functions. Once you complete that certain job function, that access should be revoked. You should not have access to things that you don't need access to to perform your job. Now that we have breached AD, the next step is to perform enumeration of AD to gain a better understanding of the domain structure and identify potential misconfigurations that can be exploited. This will be covered in the next room. Remember to clear the DNS configuration. We completed the room. Share it with my friends. Hey friends, I'm sharing with you that we completed the room. Let's go ahead and clear our network configuration manager and we'll get things set up and then we will take a short break before we jump into the next room. So let's go to advanced network configuration. Let's go to our wired connection there. Let's go to our IPv4 settings. Let's take that and let's just clear it out. Let's save it. Boom, let's system CTL restart network manager. Perfect. Let's go to our VPN connection. Let's close our VPN connection as well. 